The Seventh Tower by Garth Nix. Book Four, Above the Veil, Chapter 21. As the spears flew, Audris leapt upon Mila, grabbed her, and glided with her only a half stretch above the snow. The spears went overhead. Audris, with Mila tucked underneath, plowed through the line of shield maidens. Knives cut at the spirit shadow's back as she passed, but only sank into the shadow flesh and rebounded. Audris kept going. Ahead of her, a huge wall of golden metal loomed, part of some giant structure that disappeared up into the darkness. There was a doorway in the side, with fuzzy green lights all around it. Runeship, runeship, Mila repeated. Audris understood that this metal house was Mila's target. Perhaps when she reached it, she would come to her senses. If she reached it. Audris felt several spears strike her in the back, some of them going far enough through her to at least scratch Mila. Even so, the ice carl did not cry out. Audris kept on gliding, as close to the ground as she dared, sometimes grazing it a little with Mila. Near the door, she swooped up, dropped Mila, and turned to face their pursuers. No more spears flew. Thirty or more shield maidens drew their long knives and rushed forward in total silence. Audris drew herself up to her full height and shadow bolts of lightning formed in her hands. She was about to throw them when she heard a voice behind her call out a rapid sequence of strangely familiar words, followed by the shouted command, Stop! The shield maiden stopped. Audris would have thrown the shadow lightning, but she found herself unable to move. Whatever the words were, they had done something to the shadow in her heart, Mila's shadow. It had reached out and stilled her muscles. Audris couldn't even turn to see who had spoken. Now all she could hear was Mila's voice. Mila was suddenly babbling on about the Imerians and the Veil vale and Sushin and Audris and Adris, but it was all mixed up and it didn't make much sense. The voice spoke again. Libe. Go to Krondalem, ask her to come quickly with her medicines. Bray, go to the mother and ask her for a chateau bottle. Run! Audris kept trying to turn around. She could feel the shadow inside her going back to sleep, or whatever it normally did, and she was regaining control of herself. Slowly, she began to turn. A silver-eyed woman in black furs was cradling Mila, her hand placed firmly on the ice curl girl's heart. As Audris turned, the woman looked at her and rapidly spoke the same words again. This time they had less effect. Audris felt the shadow stir inside her, but it could not hold her. She turned completely around and took a step forward. A glowing knife appeared in the woman's other hand, a shorter version of the Merwin horn sword Mila had lost when she had impaled Sushin. Come no closer, shadow, ordered the woman. You shall not have this girl. Audra sighed and sat down. I don't want to have her, she said. The woman started, and there was a gasp from the shield maidens. Apart from the ones who had run off, they were standing still, as the woman had commanded, in a ring around Audra, none closer than thirty stretches. You speak, said the woman. It is long since we have seen a shadow that speaks. Is Mila all right? asked Audra. She feels sort of sick to me, and she's been acting very strange. Mina, asked the woman, looking down. If that is her name, she has gone far into the tenth pattern. I do not know if we can guide her out. If we cannot, she will die. I don't want her to die, wailed Audris. What will happen to me? The spirit shadow started to weep, huge shadow tears rolling on to lie black upon the snow. Beware the stratagems of shadows, muttered the woman. Lemel, you had best call the mother crone herself, and not just a shadow bottle. No need, said a calm, quiet voice. I am here. A very old, tall woman spoke. Audra saw that this one had strangely milky eyes. She walked forward with confidence, pausing to look down at Mila. Another crone, younger and less bright-eyed than the one with the knife, followed her. She went straight to Mila, took something from the bag she carried, and broke it under the girl's nose. Ah, I thought it would be Mila, said the mother crone. She got her sunstone, I see. 
She spoke of strange things, said the first crow, words she had laid upon herself to deliver, dead or alive. I have them. Then I will hear them in due course, said the mother crow. Can she be saved? If you wish it, said the younger crone. She is at the choosing of the ways. Bring her back, the mother crone instructed. I think I will want more than a few words. Now, speaking shadow, what is your name and kind? I am Audris, storm shepherd, once of Frigga's hill, said Audris. Who are you? I am the mother crone of the rune ship said the mother crone. I am the wisdom of Danir, the living sword of Bastir. Oh, said Audris. She got up and bowed. No, Aenirian is permitted upon the dark world by the ancient law of Danir, continued the crone. By what right do you come here? I came with Mila, Audris explained. She wanted to tell you about the veil being in danger and the keystones being unsealed and... Stop, ordered the mother crone. We will speak of this with Mila herself. I say again, by what right do you come to the dark world? I don't know, said Audris miserably. I just wanted to get away from the hill and then I had to follow Mila. You must be taken for judgment said the mother crone. Will you go willingly to your prison, or must I force you? Audris looked around. The shield maidens probably couldn't hurt her, though there was that crone with the glowing knife. The mother crone also seemed very confident Audris could be made to obey her. I'll do what you want, on one condition, Audris answered. We do not make conditional agreements, said the mother crone. Yet you can tell me what you want. Perhaps it is not a condition after all. I want you to stop Mila from giving herself to the ice. The mother crone looked down at Mila. She seemed to be merely asleep now, breathing normally as the younger crone cleansed and bandaged her wounds. We cannot promise that, she said. It is every ice carl's right to go to the ice. Besides... Mila herself must be judged. Perhaps our judgment will be that she must go to the ice. Audris frowned and shot up into the sky. But she knew she couldn't go very far from Mila. Even if she could escape that binding, there was no light out in the world. She would fade to nothing. There didn't seem to be much choice. What is this prison? she asked. And the judgment? Will I get to speak my side? Yes, you will be able to speak, said the mother crone, and here is the prison. She drew a tall bottle of golden metal out of her robes and unscrewed the stopper. I can't get in that, said Audris. It's too small. I think you will be surprised, replied the mother crone. Will you try? Audris felt a strange power in the old woman's voice, power that was building as if the next time she spoke, her words would fly out like a storm shepherd's bolts of lightning. Oh, all right, she said. The mother crone held out the bottle. Audris billowed down two legs and trudged over, her head downcast in defeat. Are you sure this is big enough? The mother crone nodded. Audris pushed a finger in the top, then another. Somehow she got her whole hand in an arm, and then the rest of her was sucked in like being caught up in a whirling storm. Strangely, Audris did not feel cramped. There was even some light coming in from outside, so she did not feel sick. But when the stopper was screwed back in, Audris did get a strange feeling. There was the hint of other shadows here from long ago. Shadows who had never been released who had long since faded into nothing.